General Conference 2015, a daily report by LLBN with Dr. Calvin Rock and Helena Luttrell. And now, GC 2015, LLBN daily report. Hi, and welcome again to the LLBN daily report coming to you live from the General Conference session right here in San Antonio, Texas. We're sitting here at the LLBN booth at the convention floor and we've got lots of exciting reports for you, don't we, Dr. Rock? Good to see you today, <laughs> Hannah. Good to see you too. Now, Dr. Rock, the latest report you're hearing from the floor is that our newly elected president, Elder Wilson, is making some changes in um, his administration. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. The floor was surprised and uh, some were stunned to find out on yesterday that the nominating committee came out with a recommendation that uh, the vice presidential staff, there were nine in this past quinquennium, will now be reduced to six, and that President Wilson envisioned some changes in responsibilities and assignments that makes um, having nine unnecessary, and a matter of economy, as he explained it, and uh, that in this new configuration, there are four who have um, retired, leaving five, but that he was not going to or is not going to retain two of those five. Pastor's Pardon Wanza and uh, Pastor Delbert Baker. And that while they would be relieved of their responsibilities, or of course, as we know, at the end of Quinquinium, everybody's job is up. So right. there's no guarantee of re-election. But he did not encourage their re-election, so the nominating committee cooperated with his suggestion, as it usually does, uh, with that of the president of the church, the newly elected president of the church. And uh, when those two were relieved, then that left the president and the nominating committee with three incumbents. And he added three others, or he made suggestions accepted by the nominating committee of three other names. And that brings the full complement of general vice presidents to six. Now, a general vice president is an individual who simply shares in the duties of the office of the president. I had the pleasure of serving three general conference presidents in that regard. President right. Neil Wilson, and President Robert Falkenberg, and President Jan Paulson. So I'm familiar with the psychology and the arrangement and uh, was very interested, spellbound, in the discussion that followed because the pastors who were not retained had some support and uh, wondered why they weren't and stood up on the floor and challenged the nominating committee. And the report has been sent back to the nominating committee and will be considered by it at 1.30 today, Monday afternoon, and we'll see what comes out of that. Right, so there could be more changes then. It could change. One does right. not know, but it could. <laughs> I see, well, well, thank you for that. Um, I also hear something else that's come up is some changes in the church manual um, in regard to conducting a communion service. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, there are a number of church manual issues being considered today. Yesterday, of course, it began. And uh, the one that occupied most attention on yesterday, Hannah, had to do with the responsibilities of a commissioned pastor. Now, as we know, there is a difference between an ordained pastor and a commissioned pastor. What is that difference? The difference is that the commissioned pastor cannot organize churches and the commissioned pastor cannot ordain pastors okay, that's the, or ordain anybody, really, okay. so that the commissioned pastors denied ordination privileges and uh, the commission pastor cannot organize companies or churches. That's really the only difference as far as responsibilities are concerned between what an ordained minister can do and what a commission pastor cannot do. Okay. And of course, there are some males who are commissioned as well as females, but the commission uh, 
the commission status, I'll call it, was structured most especially for women. And when that discussion hit the floor, it was, um, it was foretelling what we're all expecting on Wednesday, which is the big debate about women's automation. So several people said, let's don't discuss this. Let's don't talk about what a commission pastor can do or what a, as versus uh, an ordained pastor. Let's wait till Wednesday because we are going to slide into the ordination discussion if we do. And some said, no, let's go settle it right now. So it was great to sit there and watch the debate and to listen. And they finally decided that the nominating committee should go back and clarify what it does not at this time. Because the nominating committee, they felt, needs to specifically say that a commissioned minister or pastor may or may not, whereas now it's still fuzzy. I see. Unclear. Right. You mentioned before something in relation to that like, was it the communion service that was one of the issues in that debate? Yes. Uh, the fact the communion service was the main issue. Okay. Was the main issue. Can the commissioned pastor perform that if he or she is not ordained as an elder? Now the manual states clearly that an ordained elder may do that. Okay. But suppose you have a commissioned pastor who's not an ordained local church elder. Does the commissioning supersede the ordination mm. as an elder or not? That was essential to the debate. Right. Well, it looks like a lot of things will be coming up later this week then with regards to not just the ordination of female pastors, but a lot of the other related issues that seem to be surfacing. And it's marvelous to sit there and watch the debate. I mean... <laughs> It, when I say marvelous, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to see how different cultures view things differently. How, how cultural background drives imagery and decision making. And it was very evident in this debate, there were those cultures who felt it really didn't matter and some felt it really did and there you have it. Right, one of the things that come with having a world church. It does. <laughs> I know do. the issue of culture also came up somewhat in the debate about um, secret ballots versus open ballots. Another big discussion on Sunday. <laughs> and again, you could see the cultural divide. Um, the, the brethren sought to make certain that the electronic voting machinery was in working order and that all votes could be taken in secret. And when I say okay. the brethren, I'm sure there were some sisters involved, although that wasn't readily apparent, but the, the mechanics who put it on, the technicians were there trying to make sure that the 2,500 plus delegates could all vote by just pushing a button. But the machines wouldn't work, try as they might. Hour after hour, they would pause and interrupt the proceedings. Try your device. But they were never able to coordinate that satisfactorily. And those who were insisting on a secret ballot, which these machines provided, were happy to wait on significant votes until it got fixed. But there were others who said, what does it matter if, if you're convicted why not let everybody see what you believe? Wave your card. And that's the way we do it when it's not secret ballot. Everybody has a card, a green card. And if you're for the vote or the motion, you simply raise your card. And there are counters who will go through the aisles and count each card if it looks like a close vote. But usually the chairman can look out at the voters and tell whether there are more cards raised for uh, approval or not and that's how it's done so that discussion went on for a long time people who were concerned that we do have a secret ballot felt that the matter of following the leader is what drives the voting in certain delegations that if the union president raises his card then the pastors and other delegates will follow. 
So they want to be sure that everybody can vote their conviction without fear of retribution <laughs> or right. some kind of demerit. And yeah. so the debate rages and we'll see what happens. Uh, we hope that the secret ballot will prevail and I think it will and I think that's what the president of the church and the leadership really wants. All right. I'm here there's some concern that um, the electronic system could be working but people are uh, maybe withholding from voting using the electronic system in order to push the secret ballots. Have you heard anything about that? That they're withholding? That they're not, they're purposefully not putting their votes into the electronic system. Oh, I did um, hear that. And I also heard that somebody is sabotaging the, the machinery, which I don't believe. But, you know, in a crowd of yeah. a couple of thousand people from all over the world, there are all kinds of rumors and all kinds of speculation. But I think the simple fact of the matter is the little gadgets just don't work. Whoever, whatever company brought them in wasn't ready for us. And they have to refine the machinery. And when it's done, it'll work well. Right. I know we hope that the, the hope is that when the bigger decisions are made later on this week, especially regards to ordination, that hopefully it will be up and working by then, so people can vote their conscience um, again, as you say, without fear of retribution. Let's hope, let's hope, because <laughs> the waving of the of the card is not the most significant or sophisticated way right. to to vote. Yeah. Now, at last night, uh, two divisions gave their evening reports. Um, what have you heard from those, those reports? Yes, the East Central Africa Division gave its report. And uh, this is a territory, one of the many divisions of Africa, that has three million members. Mm -hmm. Now, our church has 18, and this one division has three over three million members. This field is comprised of Mwanza, Tanzania, Bujumbura, Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, to name some of them. And of course, is a vast field and a very lively field. There are 13,423 churches in this one division. They have 16 hospitals and clinics and the most striking figure perhaps, 19,000 plus children evangelists. You know what a child evangelist is? Not really. <laughs> a child evangelist is a little one, female or male, who has heard preaching and even at a tender age of 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe into their teenage years, likes to mimic the preacher and likes to stand up in church or in the home and preach. And they really do. Mm. And certain cultures, it's a big thing. Not a lot of people are joining the church. It's usually something they do with uh, the family or the local congregation. Mm. But occasionally they will preach to the public and they're called child evangelists. Right. They are energetic and the truth is as far as enthusiasm and conviction and passion, they outpreach some older preachers. <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, let's hope they continue to keep that enthusiasm even as they get older and become adult, right. adult evangelists. Right. Yeah. What other division gave their report last night? Yes, the Euro Asia division gave its report, and I also have some statistics from okay. uh, this part of the world. Uh, there are 13. Euro-Asia division countries, so 13 countries in this division. Some of them uh, like Russia and Afghanistan and other countries that are in Central Asia and the Far East comprise one of the most difficult parts of our world work. That's because uh, these countries are largely Muslim or have a lot of non-Christian religions mm -hmm. and that are hostile toward Christianity. Right. Buddhism and paganism and even atheism is a big thing in many of these countries. The work is very difficult and it really contrasts that of the Africa divisions 
where preaching Christ uh, is accepted so readily in most places. Here, there are already other established religions, including the Orthodox Church. I had an evangelistic meeting in 1992 in Siberia, which is in this division, and um, the Russian Orthodox Church was very hostile toward our meetings. We baptized over a thousand people. In fact, one of them we interviewed the other we day. We did. That Maybe was a great we'll interview. see that. Our guests might see that. But yeah. uh, it's not easy in many places, and we have to take our hats off to our missionaries and to our local workers who sacrifice their not just time and their lifeblood, but even their families, their missionaries who are never heard of in terms of glowing reports, but who go to these far-reaching areas of, of Siberia and other places, Afghanistan and places that are war-torn and dangerous, but they're there not only with their lives, but those of their family, their children and uh, their spouses and to hear them and to see them make their reports as to the way the division, the unions, the local conferences and missions are growing is again to thank God for Seventh-day Adventism's mission, the gospel to all the world, Matthew 24, 14, so that the end can come. Amen. Well, great. That was great news to hear that we have presence, growing presence in these countries. Um, due to the hard work of many of the pastors and church leaders and missionaries in these areas. Um, they want to continue to keep these divisions and their workers in our prayers. And then to be here, Hannah, and to walk these halls and see these people when they do have a chance to come to General Conference in the native garb, the attire of these countries. What a rich experience. All it the different been. colors and all the different accents and languages. It's just great. There's nothing better than General Conference. There's no camp meeting or federation that can touch it. It's a little taste of heaven. It is. Well, both of us caught up with some very interesting people um, during our time here at the General Conference. Um, I interviewed two special missionaries, and you've interviewed some other interesting guests. In fact, let's go ahead and roll to those um, interviews right now, and we'll see some of the stories coming to you from the convention floor. We're here now with another one of our friends and in fact, not just a friend, but a family member for me personally, but a friend to all of Seventh-day Adventism, Wentley Phipps. Pastor Phipps, great to have you. How's it going? Oh, it's wonderful to be here with you, my friend, and you look awesome. Oh, hey, the old man's still here anyway. Look, 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 and you don't mind my calling you Wentley in this interview? All right. Well, Wentley, I understand your family's with you? Yes, my whole family, well, actually my youngest son and my wife, uh, my two boys work for Florida Hospital, so they're still working. Now, the world knows you as a musician and a preacher, but tell us a little bit about your pet, your, your wonderfully conceived and executed Dream Academy. How's it going? Oh, God is blessing, and uh, he's opening many doors for us. Uh, it really started because I found out that almost 70% of all the children in America who end up in prison come from the children of prisoners and no one was doing any unique special work for them. And so we studied the problem, what do we do to break that cycle of intergenerational incarceration? And the two things we found were you have to, number one, increase the density of caring, loving adults in the life orbit of these children, so mentoring is critical, and then academic support because there is a direct link between school failure and incarceration. Today we call it the school to prison pipeline. Uh, by the age of 30, for example, 60% of all black boys in America who don't graduate from high school will be in prison by the age of 30. 60% of them, and so it's important to get them supported. So as a Seventh-day Adventist, minister, pastor, evangelist, musician, you've taken time to reach out to a societal endeavor. You didn't get this in the morning watch, or the morning devotion, or the Sabbath school lesson. That's right. God gave it to you. That's right. God gave it to you. And with all of that, you're still using your musical talent, you're blessing us around. Where have you been lately? Well, I just got in from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I was there for a program uh, yesterday. And uh, every week I'm somewhere 
uh, I call it really begging with dignity. <laughs> <laughs> I have to use my music to draw people and then give, I give, I'm, given, I'm given the opportunity because of the audience that's there to share with them this passion God's given. Are you singing here in San Antonio? Yes, I'm singing at the uh, Hope Channel every day at 5 o'clock. At the Hope Channel? Yes. Great. Yes. What about gracing LLBN, Lowellinda Broadcast Network? Absolutely. I, and I won't ask you to sing with me either. Well, I'll, I wouldn't mind backing you up <laughs> if, if I could. But uh, you got a little tune for us today? Absolutely. Come on. Well, I can't get away without saying, Amazing Grace. A little louder. Here we go. How sweet the sound. Beautiful. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amen. God bless you. And I'm ready to take up the offering. <laughs> For Dream Academy yes, or whatever. Yes, right. Thanks, Wendley. God, bless, God you bless you. Keep up the good work. Right. We love you. Love you too. Tell your dear one howdy. All right. And we'll be talking to you more as we go f about our business here. All right. God bless. Blessings. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. Wendley Phipps. Hi, I'm here with Joy Chu and Grace Lee, two missionary volunteers who are currently serving in China and Japan. And they're not serving just any ministry but a very special one. I'll let them tell you more about it. Grace, tell me more about your ministry. So currently we are um, serving people with leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease in China. So um, the ministry started nine years ago by a Korean layman and um, it's progressed ever since. Um, there's actually 600 leprosy colonies in China, but um, because of lack of volunteers, we're currently in about 10 places right now. That's strange because we haven't heard about leprosies in recent yes. years, but I guess it, it, still, it still exists. Yes. Yes. Um, there's about, in the country of China, there's about 240 people with leprosy. 24,000. 24,000, excuse me, people with leprosy living there now. Is, uh, I'm sure the first question a lot of people will be asking, is it contagious like in Bible times? It is contagious, but 40 years ago, they came up with a medication and because it's a bacterial disease, it's an antibiotic. Once they take the, the course of medication for several months to a year, it's rendered inactive. So we don't worry about getting the leprosy. That's good to know. Yes. Now, Joy, how did you get started in a leprosy ministry? Well, I was on my way back to America um, to start a job as a teaching principal. It's one of my dream jobs. Um, but the Lord convicted me through another person who had visited the leper colonies to stop by at least for 10 days. I packed my bags and I just had one um, carry-on bag in my backpack and I planned to check it out so I could come back to the U.S. and bring other young people with me on mission trips. Well, while I was there, I saw the lepers, I saw the missionary volunteers who had given up their entire lives, and I started studying the prophecies about that God has about these people and it totally convicted me to give up my job, my life, and to serve them. Uh, was that a hard decision to give that all up, to go there and serve? It was a little difficult giving up certain things, but I knew I wanted to follow Jesus with all my heart. I had been born into the church, but I think I lived a half-hearted Christian life. I wasn't all in for Jesus but Jesus gave me the opportunity to be all in for him because his coming is really, really soon and we need to do everything we can to hasten his coming. Right, that's amazing. What, Grace, what is a typical day like as a volunteer over at the leprosy colony? Uh, well, in the colonies, we meet their basic needs and that could include helping some blind people who, can't, who don't have fingers eat, um, bathing, everyday wound care, um, cleaning, um, help sewing, um, basic things, but uh, we live together in the colonies with them. And so this naturally opens their hearts to hearing about the love of Jesus. And actually, 677 people have been baptized and hundreds more are waiting to be baptized. Oh, that's amazing. 
what, what makes the difference for them? Like, what, what gave, led them to become believers in Christ? I guess the Holy Spirit working and um, through the work of Isaiah 58, um, you know, they realize that their real needs are being met and um, they see Jesus' love in a tangible way. Um, and so their lives are being changed. Um, the volunteers' lives are being changed and we are all learning more about Christ through this process. How have your lives been changed on a personal level through this experience? My life has completely changed. I went from a life of being completely immersed in church structure and organization to being in such a Holy Spirit driven, focused way of life. Daily, we try to live as Jesus lived, waiting for instructions from our Heavenly Father to go certain places, to do certain things, and um, it's been the adventure of a lifetime. Um, I think I lived with theories, only head knowledge about Jesus and about the Bible, but this ministry has shown me the way to live an integrated life of true Christianity. It's the life that becomes the light to the world, and it's the light in Revelation chapter 18 that is going to glorify God in all the world. Amen. Do you guys have any last comments for our viewers who are watching this program? Well, um, on a personal level, my life has changed and God was really showing me, um, it's been definitely a humbling process. God showing me that I was at the actual leper of sin and selfishness. And recently God has opened doors in Japan to reach out to the blind and deaf blind there. And so exciting new ministry opportunities are opening as well. So. Well, thank you both so much for your work out there and for sharing your testimony experience to our viewers. Thank you. I'm so glad I was able to catch up with those two uh, missionaries over in the leprosy colonies in China and Japan. Mm. I mean, that is dedication to God's work. Absolutely. I've been to some leper colonies. Really? And it takes total dedication. It really does. So, oh. And um, I'm glad you were able to catch up with uh, Dr. Whitney Phipps as well. Yes. That was a nice surprise. Whitley was one of my students at Oakwood. I tell everybody, Father Abraham has many sons, and he is one of them. <laughs> he and his wife, Linda, as well. Oh, great, great children to have. <laughs> thank you. Well, we thank you for joining us for this report. Again, we come to you every evening from 7 to 7.30 Pacific time with a special report about what's been going on here at the 60th General Conference Session in San Antonio, Texas. So join us every evening. On a Wednesday, uh, with our big issues coming up about ordination in particular, we'll be bringing you small reports throughout the day that you'll be able to find on our website at lobn.tv and also our YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. But otherwise, we'll join you again every evening, 7 to 7.30 p.m. with a special LLBN report. Um, until then, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.